hello Slippish Snow and recently you may have realised that I have been uploading some videos related to my frogs because as you've now discovered I have quite an extensive collection of different tree frogs and in one of my previous videos I showed you how I planted up my hourglass terrarium and in this video I'm going to be showing you how I start from the very very beginning and build an entire new terrarium. Now the terrarium that I'm using is a 45 by 45 by 60 exoterra, so it's quite a bit larger than my other one. And first of all, I start off by seeing what I am going to be designing on the background. So it all comes down to the design that I want or pieces of wood that I have or bark or cork. And then I think, how am I going to make that into a kind of a, like an elaborate design that will work for the species of frogs that I'm going to be putting into this terrarium. Now this terrarium is going to be housing flying frogs and they require a little bit more room than it would be say if it was like a smaller frog that would be jumping from areas to areas. They need a little bit of area where they can have a bit of distance and depth in their terrarium. So I don't want to put any real obstacles in the way of, of their like surroundings. Most of it's going to be mainly kept to the back of the terrarium. So in this terrarium I'm using a big piece of cork, now this piece is a lot smaller, but I'm going to be using a big piece of cork on the background and I'm also going to be using more of this coconut fibre mesh just so that I can take in a little bit more area with this instead of covering it in too much spray foam and silicon. I'm going to be starting off with this coconut fibre and this is basically just the shell of a coconut that has been ripped apart and then repressed into the sheets and it comes in big big mats. Now, you can buy this from uh, like specialist reptile places and pet shops and that, but you will pay a lot more money for it. This is basically exactly the same thing that they're using hanging basket liners. So you can go to a garden centre and they usually have this on a big roll and you can buy it by the meter. I actually ordered this off of eBay and I think it was about £7 for two metres, something like that. And if you buy it in a reptile shop, usually they will have them cut to the specific size of the terrarium so you may only get a 30 by 30 that's one of the, the smaller exoterras you may only get a 30 by 30 square and that's going to probably cost you around about the same price so with that little bit of information you'll know that this is exactly the same stuff that they line hanging baskets with so yeah you can get it a lot cheaper in certain places from like garden centers and stuff like that or, or pick it up off ebay this is easy for plants to root into it because it has all those little bits of aeration gaps in there so the plants that I'm going to be using are going to be able to root into that and then stick to it more and that will also allow me to have to cover a larger area with this instead of covering it so much with spray foam and silicon. To fix the cork and to fix the coconut matting to the back of the terrarium I'm going to be using silicon. Now it does matter what type of silicon you use with frogs because obviously some silicons have antifungicides and they have other forms of chemicals in them to keep them more in sterile conditions, say like bathrooms or swimming pools. So you want to find a silicon that has got no fungicides in it or any oils or anything like that which can leach back out into terrarium. And the one that I like to use is HA6 silicon. Now this is a brown, it does come in black, I think red, it does come in translucent and a few other colours. But I like to use the brown purely because the background is going to be covered in soil and substrate. So this, if there's any areas where that substrate hasn't quite taken very well, it will automatically be brown underneath so you won't have any gaps in colour. Now I do a little bit of overkill with the silicon on the back of this cocoa fibre, but I like to make sure that it's evenly distributed so that there isn't any risk of it peeling off later on. I concentrate on making sure that the edges are flattened down against the glass and I then run a bead all the way around that raw edge to seal it in place. Next thing I'm going in and I'm using is some cork bark. Now this obviously is a lot smaller than the piece I'm using in the terrarium build, but that is what I'm going to be using for their main structure at the background. I really want to make it look like a trunk of a tree and I have drilled some holes into certain parts of it so I can feed some plant roots into it so the plants that are going to be like epiphytic plants which are plants that grow on the trees will be able to root into that background because I've left the back inside of it hollow because the cork bark usually has a little bit of an indent and the piece that I'm using in the terrarium is a lot more curved 
So I'm going to be filling that entire background with soil and substrate which will allow the roots to root into an area behind that piece of cork. Now the next thing is spray foam, and this is the no-nonsense expanding foam. Now it doesn't really matter at all what spray foam it is that you use. I know there is one you get in America, I don't know whether we have it over here in the UK, called Great Stuff, and that is more of like a black colour, which would be easier to blend into the background with the covering it in silicon and substrate. But this is just a plain, kind of like creamy yellow colour. And this doesn't really, as I say, doesn't matter what brand it is that you use. This is basically just there to build up those areas so you can then get the mass in the area that you want. And you can go as extreme and decorative as you want with this. You want to spray this in around all of the areas that you want to build up. And you also want to spray it around your areas like your cork bark to lock them into place. Because although silicon will hold it in certain parts, there is this concave usually to cork. If you're using smaller parts, then it's going to be easier. But there is this concave, and no matter how much silicon you put on there, you're always going to have the risk of it, of it starting to wiggle and start to move. Whereas then if you go around the edges in the spray foam, that expands underneath of this area, and it begins to lock it in place. Now you can also lay down a complete layer of the spray foam, and then push your decorative pieces of wood or bark into the background, and that will also lock them in place. That's what I'm doing here. I've laid down a load of that spray foam and then I'm pushing that cork onto it and making sure that it's locked in over on that side. And then I'm just running a small amount around the edges, making sure that it's still hollow on the inside. I have also filled up one of the bottom holes there with spray foam just to make sure that the bottom of this piece of cork is locked to the bottom of the terrarium and I can always go and carve that out later on. Once you have everything in place and you've applied all that expanding foam, you will see areas that aren't really how you want them to be. Some of the expanding foam may have expanded a little bit more than you want, or it might be thicker in some areas where you had to apply to get a good even layer. Now, that isn't a problem. You can, of course, leave it like that if you're happy with it having that bumpy texture. But the thing I like to go in with is a serrated knife, and I like to start to carve out the expanding foam. Once it's completely cured, it's perfectly fine to go in and carve in any shapes that you want into that foam and then you can really customise the background to be exactly how you want it to look. This carving process of the foam comes down completely to personal preference and you can do pretty much whatever you want with it. Areas can also be sanded or painted if that's what you'd like, but I just concentrate on taking away anything that's too bulky and getting it into a nice uniform shape. In this instance, being as the inside of that cork is going to kind of act as a planter, I'm making sure that the expanded foam hasn't extended all the way to it and the inside is still hollow. I also make sure that the expanded foam is cut to the lip at the top of the terrarium, as you can see there, and it isn't extending over. That's a really important thing to check on these exoterras just before you go in to add any silicon, because you can make sure that the lid still fits snugly, being as it's all cut into place, because if it does stick over, it may have the risk of the lid not fitting. For me, once the expanding foam has been carved, I like to go over it with the HA6 and then push my substrate into that to lock that into place. And I start by just going around very, very small areas, mainly starting around the edge of the terrarium where the expanding foam meets the glass. And I use that little area and a tiny little bead all the way around to make sure that it is locked into place. No water is going to ingress into the back of the background. Now, the expanding foam is water repellent, but eventually, being as this is on such a shiny surface such as glass, it may eventually begin to pull itself away from the glass itself. So you can do that first of all, you can obviously go in and you could sand the glass a little bit in the areas that you know you're going to be applying the background, or you could apply a very thin layer of HA6 silicon all the way around to it to kind of act as a key to lock that expanding foam into place. But I like to just go around the perimeter in very small areas and then just push that silicone in with my finger. Then I'll go all over the entire area of that expanding foam with this, make sure to rub it all in place, that I've covered every tiny little area and surface that is exposed of that expanding foam. Then when it comes to having all that silicone applied and pushing the substrate into it, a lot of people have different opinions on what it is that they like to use. And none of them are wrong, they all have pros and cons, and there is good and bad things to all these kind of things, but it basically comes down to personal preference. Me, for example, I like to just push in coconut fibre. That is a good thing to use because it's just a plain flat colour. And for me, I don't like the idea of using sphagnum or cork bark in the background purely because for some of the frogs that I like to keep, for these flying frogs, for example, if there's any of those pieces that are slightly loose, like for bark, 
the area that's there could end up having something on it which the frog is attracted to eating, say a cricket walking up there, and then it will lunge at it and that small part of bark could come off and then get lodged in the frog, causing an impaction. For these larger types of frogs, I do not like to use any bark at all that can be exposed in the area where the frog could ingest any of it. But for the backgrounds, the substrate that people like to use, some people will mix in sphagnum moss, orchid bark, all sorts of other things into the backgrounds and it basically comes down to what you like. Again this process can be done in many different ways using many different things. This is purely just what I like to do and I've just applied little bits of that HA6 in certain areas, made sure that it's all spread out, covering every area of that expanding spray foam and then I just go in and I push the coconut fibre in over the top of that to lock it into place, making sure that everything is nice and evenly covered. This finished clip that you can see here is filmed a few days after that process and by this time anything that isn't attached to that silicon itself will have dropped off, can be collected and used in another terrarium. And if there is any areas that haven't quite been covered with the silicon and coconut fibre, just go in with a little bit more of that silicon and do exactly the same process as we've previously just done. The next thing is to go in and start building the drainage layer in the bottom of the terrarium. And the thing that I like to do first is get a very small piece of PVC pipe and cut it to the length that I want, which is gonna allow me to just stick it above the substrate once everything has been applied into the tank. And this is gonna act as a drainage port. Now for this, I'm using a piece of three quarter inch PVC black pipe and the very bottom of it has just got a little arch cut out of it so that the water can ingress into that area and with a little siphon or a little piece of airline, I can siphon out the water that will collect in the bottom. And I silicon that into place with the same HA6 silicon, making sure that there's a bead around the edge, but the water can still get into that pipe. Then I go in and apply a good layer of expanded clay pebbles. Now these are gonna act as your drainage layer. So everything that comes through the soil and the membrane that you apply is going to collect down in that bottom like a reservoir. And then that little drainage port that you put in with that PVC pipe is gonna act as the way of you to get in there with a siphon to take out that layer of water. Because if you leave the water in there or you apply no drainage layer, the bottom and the substrate is gonna become very anaerobic and start to produce mold and lots of nasty in the terrarium that you really don't want. I make my drainage layer at the bottom about an inch and a half deep, but the deeper you make this, the longer you can go between having to drain it out at the bottom. You can see that there's a piece of paper in that PVC pipe, and that's only there just to prevent any of the substrate or this base material getting into the inside of the pipe. Now, people look at these and they think, oh, that's gonna smell and all stuff like that. These terrariums should never smell. The only thing they should smell of is plants or soil. There is no, there should be no mold smells or damp smells. These tanks and terrariums should never ever have that kind of smell. And by applying this drainage layer into the bottom with the expanded clay pebbles and having that drainage port, you can make sure that you can see it filling up into the area and you can drain it before it begins to touch the soil. The thing that you then have to put on top of that so it doesn't touch the soil and helps to prevent the soil from mixing in with that expanded clay pebbles is this membrane. Now, I like to use two layers of membrane. The first layer of membrane that I like to use is this heavy duty woven weed suppressant matting. And I cut that exactly the same size as the lid itself. I just remove the lid, place it on top and then cut around it. Being as the background is at the back, the size of the terrarium inside is gonna be ever so slightly smaller now. So I just use that to make sure that it's the exact same size as what the terrarium originally was. Then I cut across down in where the drainage port is so that I can feed it through this first membrane and I make sure to go into the back, lay down the membrane so it's pretty flat up against the background that we've created and I can cut away bits that are slightly too large, too long in certain areas and I can also fold things underneath as well as going in and cut some little darts down into the mat in itself to make sure that it folds around and it all fits nice and snug. The next layer that I like to use is more of a fabric styled membrane and this I cut about two inches larger all the way around. That way I can make sure that it sits up the glass ever so slightly and I can encompass all of the medium and substrate into that area preventing it from getting down into that drainage layer. 
Now applying this second layer can be a little bit tricky and you by no means need to use two layers. I just like to encompass it just in this one so that I can make sure I've got a little bit of double protection preventing it from getting into that area down in the bottom. But applying this you just kind of have to manipulate it into the corners, fold it in certain places and then just get it in as best as you can and then start applying in a very very small amount of the soil that you're going to be using and use that to weigh it down so you can move certain corners and get it adjusted so it all sits nice and in place. If a little bit of the soil does get over the size of that membrane, it's not the end of the world. You can always brush it out with a little tiny paintbrush, but it's mainly there just to prevent the majority of it getting down into those pebbles. For the substrate that you apply into the background, as well as the substrate in the base of the terrarium, it comes down to personal preference, and you get your own kind of mix. But it also depends on the species of frogs, on the species of lizard or reptile, anything that you will be keeping in that terrarium will depend on the substrate that you use. If it's a larger species of animal, they have more of a chance ingesting some of that substrate and they just dive and grab. So they literally, anything that they see, they grab with their mouth and just shovel it in. For something like a dart frog, for example, they're okay with more like sphagnum moss and bark and stuff like that because they use their tongue to eat very, very small prey items. So they're not really likely to ingest too much of that substrate. So for bigger frogs, you'd be okay using some of those things. It's not ideal, but I like to err on the side of cautions with my substrate and keep most of those larger particles in the bottom of the layer that I'm gonna be using in the soil, and not use them in the background. Now if you skip forward to this part purely to see the planting up of this terrarium, this next step is an extremely important thing to take note of. I have realised that with this HA6, for a few days to almost a few weeks sometimes afterwards, it does release some fumes out into the terrarium. Now after 24 to 48 hours, it is completely cured and relatively safe for the animals. I have put animals into the terrariums after that time and had no adverse effects. But if you are going to be planting it up and using rarer types of plants, ones that cost a hell of a lot more money than Ones you can buy in garden centers. It is advisable, in my opinion, to leave it a good week to two weeks before applying any plants next to this silicon. Now, the one thing I find with this is I've done a whole entire terrarium and then I planted it a couple of days later and the plants have started to brown upon the edges. And I believe it's because of the fumes from this silicon. Now I've seen people that have built terrariums and then planted them up within 24 hours of this curing. But for me, that hasn't seemed to work. The room that I keep them in is well ventilated, but I find that I have to leave this for a good few weeks before I can even consider planting anywhere near it. Because any, any plants that I would consider putting near it, like this calathea, for example, the ends and the tips of it start to just turn brown. Um, and that's something that I've noticed. Anything that's very close to that silicon or growing on it, for the first few weeks of it sitting there, it starts to brown and looks like it's going to be like completely dead. The plants do usually come back, but I found the best way that I do it with this HA6 is to apply it all, put all the substrate in, build the terrarium entirely, and then leave it for a good two or three weeks. Now, you will know really when that smell is gone. You can still smell it ever so slightly in there, but after that time, it is 100% safe. But it's kind of like a vinegary smell. For keeping plants in best condition, I like to leave it a good few weeks before I actually plant up the terrarium. Now, that can be problematic if you've got animals that you're trying to get in as quick as possible, but I like to quarantine all my frogs anyway. So that just gives me a chance to build the terrarium and quarantine them at the same time. And then I'll have a complete new house that I can put them in, which I know is going to be completely free of any pests or parasites or anything like that. Quite a few of the plants that I'm going to be using in this build were already in the terrarium that the flying frogs were being housed in and most of them had started to grow onto the pieces of wood. So I just went in and pulled them out gently and then started to plant them into the new terrarium build. You can see that this has really rooted onto that piece of wood there and this is basically what we want to have happen into that coconut matting that I've applied onto the back of the new terrarium. And sitting there on the glass is one of the frogs themselves, the flying frogs, and if I don't disturb him, he won't disturb me. Out of the whole process of building these terrariums, this is the part that I enjoy the most and this is the point that I enjoy because I can see it all coming together. There will be a list of all of the plants that I've used in this terrarium down in the description below. Most of them will probably be in their Latin names so you'll have to go and give them a google to see what ones it is that I've used because I don't know the common names of most of these plants. Some of them I do but it's easier if I just put them down in the description and you can go and check them out and see where you can buy them for your own terrariums at home. For some of the vining type plants I use aluminium staples to keep them in place growing in the direction that I want them and everything else I just try and squeeze into where I think it will grow best. <laughs> 
Some of the plants that I'm using require a little bit more moisture as well as humidity, so I'm going to be packing sphagnum moss around them. Now I know I did mention earlier about the worry of impaction with some frogs, but as I said, I like to keep most of these kind of things that would cause a risk down into the base of the terrarium themselves and not applied into the back of the background. And as you can see, this is long fiber sphagnum moss, which makes a hell of a difference for preventing the frogs from ingesting the majority of it. Now these terrariums do require moss and sphagnum moss is the best thing to do because it retains a hell of a lot of moisture and it will also prevent that drainage layer from filling up so often. It's kind of the, the, kind of the worry that some frogs will get some impactions because I have had a frog that has been impacted by moss before and unfortunately it did kill the frog. It's something that is a risk when you have as many frogs as I do. It's going to be a risk of things happening because with you just having one or two frogs, you probably won't see any of these things. But the more frogs you have, the more likely you are to have these things crop up and have to experience them and sadly go through. One of the best things to really prevent that is using the long grain fibers, as I've said, as well as making sure that anything that is applied is really well pushed into the areas and anything that's on the base of the terrarium is flattened down so that if the frog does jump onto it or dive onto it to grab some prey items, none of it will get into the frog's mouth. Or it can pull it out being as it is too long for the frog to ingest. At the end result of this terrarium, you can see that I have adjusted the planting over time, being as there is a six months time gap difference between this and the end result. But this is the basic terrarium and what I created with the plants that I had at the time. Frogs that I'm putting into this terrarium are Racophorus keo and they are a species of flying frog. Now these are probably one of my favourite species. They are very very similar to the Wallace's flying frog which is probably my exact favourite species but they are a little bit different. They have the same kind of colorations but I do think they're just a little bit smaller. Now unfortunately I do believe that I have four males so it's pretty <laughs> impossible for me to achieve any breeding with this species but I will be looking to get some more because this terrarium is probably big enough to house probably about five or six at a push. I would usually always advise to wear gloves when handling the frogs, not because there's anything wrong with them, but more to the fact that there's something wrong with you and their skin is extremely porous and could absorb any salts or moisturizers or any products that you have on your hands. Or the other thing to do, which I'm doing here, is to make sure that your hands are wet and get them moved into the area as quick as possible and don't handle them unnecessarily. If they want to leave your hand, that is. <laughs> 
guys, this has been an extremely long video and it's probably boring to some people maybe, it could be interesting to others. It's part of my hobby which I do outside of YouTube and makeup and all my other things I do. This is basically my main hobby. <laughs> that as long as plants as well because this shit grows. You will probably see with the upcoming videos that I'm going to be putting out on my channel. I also have an addiction to houseplants and growing plants so this encompasses both of those hobbies for me. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. As always, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and until next time, bye bye.